Well, I'm, I'm going to um, give a bit of an overview of medical applications of virtual reality. Um, there's a lot of material to cover, so I'll, I'll and we, I only have about 40 or 50 minutes, so I'm going to skip every third word. But we'll save some time for questions and comments, actually, and discussions, because I think that's really important. And throughout the day, we have a number of uh, really interesting panelists following. So I'll give an overview, but they'll be going deep into some of the areas. Um, OK, well, wh why don't we get started? Um, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I've been involved in working on virtual reality technology and its medical applications for almost uh, 30 years now. So you can imagine it's a very exciting time for me to see things just take off like a rocket. And, and so much good work being done and the technology to be at such a affordable price point. Uh, I, I'm also excited because I, I view us right now as being in sort of the 300 baud modem days where we can see what's possible. Uh, we can slowly see the web page load up and we think maybe one day we'll be able to you know, rent a car using this technology or something like that. But we're not quite there yet. And I think that's where we are with VR technology. We can do things. We can do amazing things. But there's so much more that will happen once we get better avatars with better facial expressions and nonverbal communication, once we have social VR uh, spun up, uh, once um, um, we build in more infrastructure behind uh, the virtual environments, once we come up with some standards. So this is the early days. But that's a great opportunity for the people who are scientists or entrepreneurs here to establish some of the pioneering research and findings and uh, some of the standards. So I'll talk a little bit further about that. Um, uh, Mike, you missed a chance. We went around the room and everybody had to introduce himself, but they'll get to know you later. Um, okay, well, let's wade into it. Um, wh what time's the next session? It's in f two o'clock. So we've, we've got about 40 minutes. Uh, and please, let's be very informal. If I say something that does, that you strongly disagree with or, or you, you uh, love, just you know, jump up and, and say so. I, I'd rather have a discussion and not have this be a spiel. But I still am also going to try and lay the groundwork for that discussion. So here's how I view things right now. I think there's four major problems in the world that some of us worry about and stay up late at night thinking about. And one of those four is uh, the healthcare crisis with an aging population. Um, if you look at the demographics, and this is just for the US, but it's also more so in many other companies, countries, particularly in Asia, we can project, looking at the demographics, that we're going to be top heavy very soon. Um, that the age bracket of people who are over uh, 50, over 60, over 70 is getting larger. And, and these aren't theories. We can look at the age of people now and add a few years, and we know exactly what's going to happen. And the percent of younger people to take care of them is declining. Uh, meanwhile, um, meanwhile, we just we just uh, we just don't have the infrastructure to house and take care of people with um, these the inherent um, chronic conditions that go with with aging, and we can't build enough buildings to do that. So the only way out of this problem is to employ technology to help address some of the problems that occur with an aging population. And I think the only way to do that is with technology. Um, amazingly enough and wonderfully enough, there is a healthcare revolution going on right now, uh, the digital health revolution, where things are shifting very f uh, fast to mobile health-based systems, uh, wearable sensors. The patient is becoming the center of activity as opposed to uh, um, you know, being a part of the food chain that it goes to the clinic and gets seen there. And we leverage all the things that the internet brings us. Uh, we can make games, things competitive or collaborative or social. So there's some powerful technologies that are coming into the digital health revolution. And um, um, Davina from Paratherapeutics is doing some pioneering work in that area right now. Um, right now, every medical device is being hooked up to the internet, uh, you know, from spigmometers to thermometers to to um, uh, goniometers, and we're collecting a huge amount of data. And this is being driven by the quantified self movement um, uh, as the initial pioneers, and it's big. Uh, we still have a lot of way to go, but there's some early adopters out there who are measuring everything from how they sleep, what they eat, uh, where they go, who they interact with, uh, what their, what their uh, sleep architecture is, and that data is being collected. And people are getting very open to sharing that data for health reasons. This allows us to build some amazing platforms that can collect this data and look at populations. 
we know that um, with some of the more uh, pernicious problems that we have in our culture, such as uh, anxiety, depression, um, um, other areas here that it's not a one size fit all, that there's several different subcategories for, for many of the diseases, particularly in behavioral medicine. We haven't had the ability to tease them out and come up with predictive, personalized medicine. But with the big data analytics that comes from the digital health resolution, we're able to do that. And a big part of that, and of course, once we have this data and the big data analytics, uh, we can match objective behavior and activities to intervention and population trends. Um, so a big part of that is going to be uh, medical applications of virtual reality technology. And again, it's the very early days, but we already have some great examples of some very profound things that can be done. And uh, here's the bottom line of my talk today. Uh, I'll give it to you now, and, and then we can talk about it later. But my perspective is that uh, we're in a fantastic position to leverage. We've had virtual reality technology since uh, uh, the mid-'80s. Research groups have been doing studies on what works, what doesn't work, even using very low resolution, um, inefficient systems. We, we know the protocols, the paradigms that are successful. And now that VR is affordable, it's gonna spring out of the university-based clinics and move into uh, the standard of care. And that's our opportunities to help make that happen in the right way. So VR and AR technology will impact medical health care in a variety of areas, everything from prevention and wellness, better assessments and measurements, uh, improved adherence, and this is key, uh, behavior change, which has always been a pernicious problem, um, distributed care delivery, being able to push delivery out to any place, and better management of chronic conditions. So again, it's been a wild journey for me. I had much more hair when I first started doing this. Uh, um, and uh, it's really been quite fun. Back when the day when I was involved, uh, to do VR, you needed a $500,000 computer and uh, an extremely heavy head-mounted display that we would sometimes counterbalance with a brick. Um, but we have to research and, again, understand some of the things that work and are useful. And you can leverage that work today by going to um, uh, PubMed and researching some of the fundamental research that's been done in some of these areas. Um, but it's taken a while. I, I was asked by um, um, a group in China to come over to help after the 2008 Sichuan earthquake. And I brought some VR system over and I trained some psychologists. There were approximately 50,000 school children who'd been traumatized because the buildings they were in during that earthquake weren't built very well and they fell down. A lot of children died. And that's a huge number of people to treat uh, from a disaster. And we were hoping to scale and address that problem using current technology. We couldn't. It was just too expensive, too unwieldy. Um, I think we could now. I think when there's another disaster, um, we could go in with some of uh, the less expensive mobile phone-based systems and provide help. And I think that's an opportunity for someone to be prepared to do that. Um, so as you guys know, because you're here at this conference, now is the time for VR. Uh, all the major tech companies are putting effort into coming up with not just better HMDs, but better ways of putting our hands and our body into VR, better ways of measuring what goes on in VR, uh, better ways of analyzing the data and presenting it. Um, so it's an excellent time to leverage the technology that's out there. Every major technology company, and, and not just the technology companies, the medical device companies and the pharmaceutical companies all have a team looking at how to apply VR technology to their problem, to their market area. And it's not just the hardware. There's, uh, uh, this is Tipitat's, uh, I think it's from 2016. It's even more crowded now. Uh, this is a quick map of some of the major players in the VR industry. Huge number of startups, too. Um, and within that, medicine is a very important vertical. And as you guys know, uh, VR is taking off really fast, faster than people originally projected. Uh, you know, some of the, it's hard to come up with an absolute number, but people are predicting that within three years, we'll have, uh, maybe as many as 30 million people using VR. This is a great opportunity for us to bring out health and wellness and clinical applications uh, given this rapid adoption curve. And, and by the way, when I talk about VR, I'm using it sort of in a general sense. Uh, I'm also talking about AR technology. In, in my opinion, it's sort of a false dichotomy. I think there's a spectrum of immersion, and uh, I don't like these abrupt uh, categories. Um, but so when I say VR today, I'm, I'm really talking about all aspects of immersive interactive technology. 
And uh, one of the projects I'm working on with some colleagues is to try and develop uh, more interactive VR cave environments uh, so that we can have uh, people have a shared interactive experience in a room as opposed to having to wear an HMD. So um, again, I'm gonna pick up the speed here because there's a lot of ground to cover, but um, it's my belief that VR will be one, medical VR will be one of the deepest verticals for VR. Um, I think it'll take us a little while to get going to do the validation studies, to really build things out, come up with the right distribution channels. But um, uh, I think health and wellness and clinical intervention is going to be greatly benefited by VR and the market will come there and the technology companies will help us do that because they're interested in having VR be more than just entertainment and games and they want to see it move to the enterprise. Um, later today we'll have on one of the panels some of the representatives from some of these technology companies and they'll talk about their interest and where they're going with it. So let me try and get a little more specific and again um, keep in mind there's a library of studies that have already been done looking at everything from addictions to autism and Asperger's to um, mild cognitive impairment uh, assessment and intervention to um, helping with uh, surgical uh, planning and sequencing and team training. Uh, this has all been research and it's one of the things that I think a lot of people haven't followed up on. A lot of the technology developers have said, here's a great use case and they've started building. They haven't looked back to see where we've gone before, where the shipwrecks are, where the swamp is and, and where the opportunities are. So I encourage you if you're interested in this arena to, to check in on some of the research labs that have been doing research in this area. Um, I view this, uh, this landscape in a very simplistic way as having four major application areas. Uh, health and wellness, uh, preventative medicine and uh, behavior change to improve health. Medical training, team training, and we'll have a talk uh, later today from um, John from Penumbra will talk about their training applications. Uh, better assessments, more accurate objective assessments uh, for both physical and cognitive issues, and then medical interventions. And I'll try and give a sample of each of those as, as we go. Um, in the medical training area, um, there's a very long list, uh, uh, specific clinical skills training, surgical skill training, interpersonal skill training, so how you, can you work as a team, how to use specific equipment and tools. Sometimes it's a very expensive procedure uh, where people are flown into training centers. We can now do that in a distributed manner. Uh, team training, for example, an emergency department uh, responding to uh, working with the fire department and the police department uh, to rehearse what happens when there's a major catastrophe. Um, teaching empathy, teaching how to have more of an understanding of what the patient experience is or the clinician experience. Um, Here's an example of a group, um, a Parvati's dev group, that has um, for a long time been pioneering ways to take some of the simple medical procedures, gamify it a little bit, and break it down as a way that it can be trained. And this is an old video that I think their stuff is a little bit more um, um, robust now in terms of its graphics, but it's still pretty good. And you get the basic idea that they can simulate, um, I think this might be preparation for a dialysis procedure, I'm not sure, um, where they can teach you the sequence, what needs to be done in what sequence, how to do it, and give you feedback if you're not doing it the right way. You can practice offline or practice as a team to do these procedures. Um, we've had VR for part of surgical training for many, many years. Um, it just hasn't been called VR. Um, for some reason, uh, up until the recent surge of VR, uh, the medical establishment was, was hesitant to to say um, VR training for surgical skills. So they called it surgical simulation. And there's many very expensive $30, $40 million surgical simulation training centers that were built on the old school expensive technology. But now with the new emerging low cost technology, this can be pushed out and be done at the clinic or at the hospital or at the medical school to learn these procedures. You don't have to fly in and spend a weekend to learn a new surgical procedure using a new tool. And I think, John, you're, you're, you're probably talking a little bit about that later today. Uh, look forward to that. Um, but we've had these very expensive simulators that have allowed us to decompose a surgical procedure, create the right haptic feedback and visual feedback so someone can learn a surgical procedure and rehearse it so they don't have to learn on the job. And we can also quantify the best way to do something. And, that, and that's really important, the quantification part. Um, in the same vein, we're in a position to come up with much better assessments a lot of the neuropsychological tests, and, and, and I, I love uh, our neuropsychological colleagues, but they've been limited by paper and pencil tests and observation. Finally, with virtual environments, we can come up with a standard way to assess someone's 
behavior and score it in a realistically ecological correct way. We can do better neuropsychological assessments. We can measure activities of daily living to see if someone's after a stroke or after uh, an injury able to return to work or to return to uh, uh, living at home independently. Uh, there's applications in physical medicine, OT and PT. And then behavioral medicine is going to be really big. Uh, I'll give some examples of that. But we finally have some new tools to not just um, intervene, but to do a better job of measuring behavior. And that'll open up a lot of doors. Uh, so in that vein, there's a number of uh, groups out there who are looking at ways of taking some of the digitized um, cognitive assessment tools and migrating them to a functional virtual environment to do a more objective, quantified way of assessing function. And from there, we can come up with better interventions. Uh, and there's a long list of uh, some of those interventions. I, I won't have time to go through all of them, but uh, you know, physical therapy uh, and rehabilitation, neurorehabilitation, stroke and traumatic brain injury, speech therapy. There's a, an interesting company, I think they're exhibiting here, um, um, uh, Vivid Vision, uh, that has a system for um, treating strabismus and amblyopia. Uh, acute and chronic pain management is, is, a, is a great opportunity, and there's a number of groups uh, developing exciting applications there. But the list goes on. Uh, if we start moving to behavioral medicine, we get a very long list, uh, helping with addiction, substance abuse, drug and alcohol abuse. There's applications used to help people with schizophrenia, which is interesting. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of research going back for, over the years for that. Generalized anxiety disorder, mood disorders, mild cognitive impairment, autism, ADHD. Um, phobia and anxiety disorders, impulsive, impulsive uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, if you don't see your favorite disorder up here, it, it's not because it hasn't been studied and there isn't an opportunity, it's just that I haven't listed it out. Um, and then we also move into the preventative health. Uh, this was a list of interventions for people who have a clinical problem, but there's a lot on the health and wellness preventative measurement, uh, preventive medicine area that we can do too. Um, helping people uh, learn weight management skills and motivating to do that, motivating them to exercise, managing stress, helping as an interface for people with a disability, addressing isolation, which is a big problem, especially with an aging population, grief counseling helping with mood and resilience training so that uh, people have an anger management issue or problems with uh, depression have some tools to, and can learn some tools to address that. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about why does this work? Um, why are we able to have some successful interventions using VR technology? What makes it qualitatively different than the previous systems? And one of the big things is adherence. We, we often know what's going to help people live a happier and healthier life, but it's very hard for people to adhere to that because we have trouble visualizing the future and the effects of our behavior on our future self. Well, in VR, we can, we can address that. So, um, um, and again, the issue is why now? Why are things poised to take off now? Well, it's finally, it's inexpensive. It's not as bulky. And I think there's also been a state change. I, I think uh, Mark Zuckerberg, by purchasing um, Oculus and building it out. That, what was it now? We're up to like $4 billion invested there. And the other companies that have invested these big poker chips in VR, it's made it less of an exotic thing. So it's not just the reduction in cost, but it, I think it's more acceptable for a clinician to use a VR system to help with behavior. And we're already seeing clinics dedicated to using VR for, for health. Uh, at Stanford, Kim Bullock has stood up a uh, uh, VR mental health clinic uh, to help people with uh, uh, some of their psychiatric and psychological problems. And this will be a growing phenomenon. Um, and one of the things I'm excited about is that it allows us to reach outlaying populations uh, that otherwise might not be able to come into a clinic. Or, and it do, you don't have to be in the outback for that. It could be that you're in an apartment building in Manhattan, but uh, you have a physical disability, and it's just really hard for you to get out and see your clinician or interact with people. VR can help span that, um, that distance again, in a measurable, quantifiable manner, which is key. We also have a lot of underlying support technology that's coming out that will help this, such as smart avatars that are emotionally sensitive. Uh, this is uh, the work of, uh, at ICT in terms of coming up with uh, 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 an avatar that not only uh, can recognize what you say, but also recognize your gaze, your point of view, your tone of voice, and use that to inform how she or he guides you through, well, it really, guides you through a process. And that can be used in a lot of, a lot of different applications. I'll show you just a very clip, quick clip from Skip's work here. Hi, I'm Ellie. 
Thanks for coming in today. I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. And please feel free to tell me anything. Your answers are totally confidential. Are you okay with this? Yes. So, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. That's good. Where are you from originally? So, notice how I'm from Los Angeles. we're tracking the person's oh, I'm gaze from LA and voice tone to score some of when the, was the last time you felt aspects really of happy? the interaction and come up with a measurable uh, score for uh, um, When mood. was the last time? Hmm. So, uh, I think the major use case for this at the current state will be for training people how to do a, a, an evaluation and interview. But we can push it out to areas where we might want to have an avatar do some initial screening for someone who uh, might not feel comfortable talking to a clinician and, and, but yet needs some help and guidance. Uh, let me give you some other examples of how we can use uh, VR technology uh, clinically. One uh, strong area is uh, for treating um, post-traumatic stress and phobias, uh, fears. Uh, we can use uh, VR to do what's called exposure therapy where we are able to create, a, in order to change a cognitive state, you have to evoke a cognitive state. And we can use VR to do that by um, gradually, systematically um, taking people back to the thing that they're really, really scared of, something that was traumatic for them. If I just ask a patient to use their imagination to do that, uh, it's very hard for them to do that. Their brain doesn't want to go there. But I can gradually take them there using VR technology and again measure um, their responses both uh, uh, behaviorally and uh, biometrically to help guide the, the process. And, and this um, uh, applies to a whole variety of uh, interventions, including, for example, addictions. I can use a uh, simulated environment to help with uh, teaching people um, situational confidence, uh, learn refusal skills, uh, learn how to manage uh, their cravings. If I'm just using a pa talking to a patient in my clinic and I say, imagine you're in your favorite bar and your friends are putting you peer pressure on you to do a line of cocaine, their brain won't go there adequately for them to learn the skills. But if I can place them there, evoke the cravings, I can teach them the skills necessary to manage their behavior and go in a way they want to go, and they can practice. Um, so this can be done in um, a clinic. You don't have to take someone out to uh, a combat zone or to a, uh, uh, an airport, and you can do it in a gradual, controlled manner with different degrees of immersion. Um, Here's an example of another way of doing an improved cognitive assessment. In this case, it's for ADHD by creating a virtual classroom. The virtual classroom attention evaluation system consists of a virtual classroom environment and utilizes the standard continuous performance test. So it uses a standard test with multimodal distractions. But it's a little more well ecologically correct than just using head, a paper test. Arm, test. And leg. The user takes a 13-minute test in the VR environment, and the CPT test results, as well as all movement data, are recorded. A test report is issued immediately that contains a personalized data analysis. And this is key. Analysis. We get some data that data. we can compare and do population studies. This may help parents receive a fast screening and assist clinicians to evaluate the ADHD diagnosis objectively. Just one example of how there's a possibility for a new generation of objective assessments um, and concomitant interventions. Um, one area I'm particularly interested in, uh, at one point, I, Stanford has a center on aging, and I was running the MIND division for a while. I have a particular interest in cognitive aging and something we all should be worried about, because I think as we age, we're going to get very, our, our healthcare industry is going to be very good at keeping our, our bodies alive, but what about this? And by the time we get up into our 70s and 80s, two out of every seven of us will have a neurodegenerative disease using the current uh, demographic statistics. We need to figure out a way to do something with that. And so I'm very interested in the opportunity for uh, applying VR both as an assessment, intervention, isolation reduction system, help with disabilities, facilitate rehabilitation, in particular for our aging seniors. I'm hoping to do it before I get up there myself. Um, again, we can use um, VR to help with um, uh, refusal skill training, um, 
and helping people um, uh, learn to control their own behavior by giving them feedback and keeping them in cognitive stills to manage their cravings. Uh, this has been shown in research in laboratories to work, and now it's ready to be translated out to um, um, the clinical world. There's also a concept of stress inoculation to prepare someone for a stressful procedure. In, in this case, the CDA, CDC did some work uh, um, helping uh, scientists and first responders be prepared to go into disaster areas, um, like for a, a, a Ebola epidemic in Africa or, or after an earthquake or tsunami. And it's been effective at helping people who never normally would go into a disaster area be psychologically prepared for what they're going to see, do it in the safety of, of their home instead of learning on the job. Uh, we've extended this concept to a project that uh, um, my colleagues, and we're talking a little bit about it later today, a uh, project we call Project Braveheart. Um, where we've done virtual hospital tours to help reduce the pre-procedure anxiety. In this case, we've worked with the Stanford Children's Hospital Pediatric Department, and we know weeks in advance what the worst day of these kids' life is going to be, and that's the day they're scheduled for, for a cardiac procedure. And so we can give them the ability to walk through the hospital. We can green screen in other kids who've gone through the procedure and have them talk about what's going to happen in each of the rooms have them learn some relaxation and stress reduction skills. Um, and uh, it's an experiment. We're, we're going to collect data to see how helpful it is at reducing uh, the stress um, of these kids and what the outcomes are going to be on surgical procedures. But I'm very excited about it. And my colleague, Don Bland, here is the producer of that project. I'm, I'm really excited about it. And we'll be talking about it a little bit more in detail at a later session today. Um, I'll, I'll just show a few seconds of our video about this. Uh, but please come to the later talk to hear more. Braveheart is an interactive VR experience developed to reduce stress levels in children who will be undergoing a surgical procedure. Patients and their families are guided through a 360 degree video tour of the hospital by a virtual companion. The gender specific tour guide provides a friendly, approachable, and relaxing tour of the facility and introductions to doctors and key hospital staff. Along the hospital tour, patients visit the key rooms they'll encounter on the day of their procedure to help make the unknown more familiar. Children learn about parts of the procedure and can even practice mindfulness and relaxation exercises. So it's an experiment and we're conducting it right now and we'll have talk a little bit more about it later today if you're interested. Uh, I'm very excited about that particular application. You can see how it could generalize to you know, helping people who are um, re-entering after an injury to go back into the work environment. Uh, there's a lot of applications of stress inoculation and um, um, anticipatory anxiety reduction. Uh, here's another example uh, where we're using VR to help uh, train people how to give bad news about a terminal illness, for example. This would be a, a clinician would learn to interact with a patient who's just received a difficult diagnosis and could go in different directions. They could get, the, the patient could get angry, very sad, uh, maybe violent, maybe withdrawal. I'm so scared of getting breast cancer. I don't know how I can handle this. This is really hard news to hear. So, so you can see the opportunity for practicing in advance so that a, a, this very important thing of being able to deliver bad news can be, you can learn the skills before you have to do it on the job, which also reduces the clinician stress, uh, too. We can also use VR to train doctors and staff to understand the patient perspective by putting them in a the first-person point of view of the experience the patient goes through. Um, there's a lot of groups out there. Uh, this is more of a slide to show the fact that the investment money is coming in here. I, I, sh I wish I'd had time to put a number up here as a participant, but just an example of uh, two companies uh, and um, there's other startups out here, such as V Recover, uh, which you'll hear about a little bit later today, hopefully. Um, but uh, Reflection Health has raised uh, at least 7.5 million in a Series A, maybe more. MindMaze uh, raised $100 million at a $1 billion valuation um, to come up with what they call NeuroVR. Um, these are just two examples indicating the fact that there is financing available for some of the things that we're talking about. Um, people are getting the vision and realizing it's an investable opportunity. So um, in the few minutes I have left, I want to talk about uh, very briefly about why is VR particularly helpful, uh, especially in behavioral medicine? What is the neuroscience behind it? Well, um, in order to change uh, a, a 
brain condition, and, and please, uh, my neuroscience experts, friends, uh, forgive me for being very simplistic here, but in order to change a cognitive state, you need to be able to evoke a cognitive state, and VR does that in a very robust way. Um, we can activate reward systems, uh, make it interesting and engaging cognitively. We can shorten the feedback loop. We can show someone what the effects of their behavior is five years down the road by showing them their age-progressed avatar. Um, we can show them if they run in place, uh, we can show that uh, their avatar gets skinny right away instead of two years later. So we've done some laboratory research showing how we can leverage the way our brain works and our reward system is to change behavior. And one particular way that we can do that is by leveraging our mirror neuron systems. Uh, we all have built into our brains um, ways of reading each other's minds. I can look at you and see your facial expressions, your body language. I can understand your mood state. Well, I can also put that into, this is an age-progressed avatar. And by seeing your age-progressed avatar, and this has been shown in a, as a robust intervention, um, you realize how the decisions you make today, the behavior you have today, affects your future self. And that's a very powerful tool that we just don't, can't get with, uh, without using VR technology. Um, I think I'll skip that one. So again, this is sort of my summary slide. Um, I think um, we have a foundation of concepts, uh, paradigms, protocols, and we, we know from previous laboratory research what, and clinic research what, what can be done and accomplished. VR is now much more accessible and affordable and acceptable. Um, VR tech is already being used for all aspects of prevention, education, and disease management. VR technology is poised to move into the mainstream, and it's just going to get better. It's going to become more enhanced, more ubiquitous, supported by all the other emerging technologies such as AI and deep learning that will go behind this. So that's my talk, my spiel. Um, we're going to have a, a really healthy um, few sessions following today. I hope you stick around for that. And I think I have a few minutes for questions and uh, maybe dialogue and debate, too. Let's start. Does anybody disagree with any of the points I made or, or, or have a, a question where the, you want to be, you know, um, you want to challenge what I've said? Because I would love to hear that. Yes? I, I don't disagree or anything like that. Uh, my question Next question, then. <laughs> So glad you asked that. Um, the lab that I'm associated with at Stanford is called the Virtual Human Interaction Lab, and that's been one of our focuses. How can VR be used to promote pro-social behavior? And we have a number of studies where we've looked at how um, acting uh, as a superhero in a virtual environment promotes uh, altruistic behavior afterwards, or how sawing down a virtual redwood tree measurably changes people's paper conservation behavior. So we've shown how uh, VR can help you be more empathetic to your own self, more empathetic to others, and more empathetic to the world. Uh, so if, if you go to VHIL um, at Stanford University, uh, you can get some of our research papers. But you know, I think VR has great potential to put someone in somebody else's point of view and promote empathy. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, excellent question. Um, how do we keep uh, headsets sterile? Um, uh, there's a number of groups that are using VR clinically, and they grapple with this. Uh, to some extent, what they tend to use is use um, a mobile phone-based system where they can take the head-mounted display out, wipe it down, um, put it in an autoclave, perhaps. I, I don't know if that works, but uh, um, and then and put you know put sort of like condoms on the uh, head-mounted display to help protect it. But but it is an issue. Um, not for the interior. They've just put it on the parts that talk to the face. But I, I, I think it is an issue. And, and I should get back to your other question about realistic avatars. I think it's going to be really key. Um, I think um, right now the avatars that we have look very robotic, and they don't have the micro expressions of the faces. We also don't have the nonverbal behavior aspects of things. So that's one of the opportunities and challenges is to have better avatars, for, especially for behavioral medicine, psychiatry, psychology, et cetera. Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I think, you know. Can you repeat the question? Oh, the, the, yes, I, I will. The, the, if I understand your question correctly, it was, what about nausea? Have there been studies to see how discomfort with the virtual environments might affect some of the results we're getting? And can we use VR uh, for different age group, for like seniors, for example, or people who are post-stroke? Are they comfortable wearing an HMD? Uh, did I catch that right? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, there has been studies where people have looked at VR technology, two different age groups, looked at acceptability. Uh, it tends to be the older technology was real problematic. People did get nauseous unless uh, there were, and there's some tricks actually in the old literature that we can use to reduce uh, that feeling of vertical and nauseous. What makes a big difference is being able to, if you're just looking at a virtual environment and you're being moved through it you're by somebody else, or you're using a joystick to move through it, there's a proprioceptive vestibular disconnect that causes more nausea. If we get our hands in, ideally our legs, then we reduce that. Uh, it's getting better, but it is an issue. And, 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 but there have been some studies looking at what creates a better feeling of presence, a better feeling of immersion, and what reduces some of the, some of the problems of discomfort. Yes? Well, that's great to hear. I, I think it is an issue to be addressed, especially for different use cases like people with disabilities or, or with uh, um, you know, post-stroke, for example. But I, I'm optimistic that we can, we can adapt the existing systems to that problem. And, and yes, light field technology is very exciting. Yes? Um, you had mentioned that augmented reality, you would you know, kind of categorize it in with virtual reality, and I would agree with that. Do you happen to know of any um, instances or areas where the use of augmented or mixed reality has more efficacy than, than um, virtual reality for clinical treatments? This is fantastic because everybody's asking me the perfect questions um, and, and I actually have an answer for that one. The question was um, uh, efficacy of AR for particular situations uh, as opposed to VR. And, and here's AR, AR and MR. Here's my perspective. Um, I think for things like post-traumatic stress, where you need to take some, get someone to think about, or phobias, where you have to get someone to think about something that they otherwise don't want to think about, we need to block out the rest of the world. Um, if you're trying to teach someone a skill, like uh, stroke rehabilitation, it's good to build in the rest of the world, because then you can use the world to, um, as part of the functional evaluation, et cetera. Um, I think it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I think there's some great use cases of AR, um, I'm very excited in the field of uh, teaching social skills um, to be able to use um, AR technology to help people who can't easily recognize facial expressions and nonverbal communication or room dynamics. Uh, AR is a perfect way to do that because we can take the existing things and maybe give some additional information and additional clues for that. So there's a whole, this is, there's a spectrum of immersion, there's a spectrum of use cases. Yes, please. Uh, could you say that again? Where do you think has the biggest role to play? Is it training or is it um, That's a good question about what's, where can haptics play a role. Um, I think for a long time we've been sort of uh, pretending that you know, like we'll have something vibrate to give you the feeling of the edges of an object. And it's really not the same. I, I think uh, if for muscle building, um, full haptics would be really great with a robot pushing back of some sort. I think for training how to do something where you need to he feel the weft and the he heft of an object, uh, um, it would be really great to have that. Um, I think so much of how we're interacting with virtual environments right now is um, we we've sort of skipped that step. I, I think haptics would be fantastic to have. Um, and, and I think we'll get there. I think we'll also get, do a better job of getting our legs in. I think we're getting there with our hands, but we're not there quite with our legs. Um, but. It's very hard to see. You know, uh, haptic technology right now is expensive and, and not, not, not very portable. But I think we'll get there. And for surgical training, yes, we've, we have some great algorithms to simulate tissue deformation and pulling back. That's been done for a long time. Um, but we haven't had a great end effector to provide it. You know? So we've got the software and algorithms to simulate uh, all the aspects of a surgical procedure. Not very many good uh, simulators to provide the haptic feedback. Yes? Uh, one thing we can anticipate with augmented 
reality is when I when I've worn the headsets, you know, they kind of darken the atmosphere in order to augment the, the image displayed, which is a fundamental conflict with the surgeon because we flood the optics and we flood the light. Right. Uh, do you expect or fear that emerging technologies in this regard that is this going to always be a fundamental problem where we're going to have to have a kind of a sunglass effect in order to see the uh, image portrayed? Or is it emerging technology that's going to allow us to experience the augmented image in the context of standard lit room? I don't know. Uh, I, I agree with you that it's a problem that in order to overlay the training and operating a room with extra information, um, you need it to, there's a big disconnect between the brightness that you have. Um, I think we'll solve it. I, I, I just don't know when. I think for training that we can change the vectors, but to do it in real time uh, in a surgical room, uh, it's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else know uh, the answer to that question? Uh, is, are there emerging ways to uh, provide AR without having to darken the room? I think there's so much effort going into coming up with better display technology that I think it'll be solved. I just don't know if it'll be five years or 10 years. Um, yeah. According to the research, I've actually read papers that read, there's been pushback as to whether immersing in scientific learning, and of course, um, the uh, velocity, whether there's actually any double blind clinical proof that you can modify the discovery to enhance their. Yeah, uh, there are. Um, it, it's a controversy because some groups have, and I won't name names, sort of exaggerated what you can do with uh, uh, digital medicine technology to increase, you know, some people make it seem like you could prevent Alzheimer's by using their software. Uh, so these exaggerated claims have been a lot of noise. If you look at the research literature, there's some very exciting things. Uh, um, Noah and I were just talking earlier about a study uh, done by Adam Gazeli up at UCSF and his group where they used, um, uh, and it wasn't fully immersive, but they used an interactive virtual environment to train people in their 60s and 70s um, one aspect of executive function, a cognitive skill, and they were to get their scores down to the same level of people in their 20s very easily. And what was cool is they went back and studied them later, and the phenomenon of learning um, how to do this um, persisted over time. So, it, it, um, so yes, there are some studies. There's also a lot of crap out there, just to be honest with you. Yeah. How are we doing on time? What time is the next session? Is, is it um, at 2? In 10 minutes. Oh, we, so we have a little more time. OK, great. Yes? So uh, I'm from Intel side, not academic. Mm -hmm. so my question is, uh, if we are actually, uh, we, we, could, we handle vision, right? How about all the sense? Human has five sense. So right. Any from academic based on your experiment? Do you have any recommendation how we handle better interactive uh, solution for the Sure, and it's not just a problem for medicine, it's a problem for all aspects of interacting with virtual environments. Well, I can tell you right now there's a USB-enabled uh, smell generator that I've used in some of our research. Uh, we did it for PTSD research uh, uh, interventions, and we had napalm and, and um, cordite and pizza and garbage. I mean, you can buy these smells. But um, there, there's, and I think, I'm sure there are companies, startups out there that are making, for, the, for gaming, et cetera, a lot of smell generators. Uh, um, but what about the other senses? I mean, we talked about haptic and force feedback, proprioception. Visual, we've got pretty good. 3D sound, we're great at. Um, uh, I think what's missing really is social VR right now. I, I, I think we're horrible at, you know, when you see people in VR right now, they look like robots. And I might be talking to you, and you might be smiling, and I don't know it because I don't have the sensors to pick up your, your facial expressions and put it on your avatar. So that's the sense I'm thinking, is that social sense is missing right now in a lot of VR. But, you know, uh, sound, sight, smell, uh, we can do. It's not that common. Um, uh, touch, um, they're, they're, we're getting a little bit better at that, and haptics is on its way. Um, what else are we missing? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I think that'll be at the back end of a lot of things we're doing. Um, yes? Finally, a question I, I don't have an answer to. Um, I won't even pretend to have one. I, I will, I, I agree, it's unexplored territory. We don't know what's the effects on, especially on a developing brain, um, on spending so much time in a virtual environment. And you know there's gonna be parents, because they work three jobs, who you know, their kids watch, spend a lot of time in VR playing games or doing whatever, and it's gonna affect the developing brain. My own personal impression is that it's a little bit like uh, when I get in my car, I get into car driving mode, and when I get out, uh, my whole my my cerebellum knows I'm not driving the car, and I walk and I move, and I, I don't have the same, you know, uh, scripts that I would do. And I think VR will be the same way. But it, but will that have an effect at disconnect? I don't know. I, I think we can use VR to help people with disassociative problems, and that's been shown clinically. But will we create some of those disassociative problems? I don't know. I know. Um, it's a consideration, but it's not an area that I'm actively doing research in. But, but there are people who are looking at it. Yeah. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned a lot of uh, behavioral health issues uh, that are being targeted using VR. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of companies are trying to replicate existing uh, protocols for uh, helping with those behavioral issues. Are there any standardized metrics What we do is we go back to the existing standards. Um, you know, if we're studying uh, uh, mood or movement or uh, a clinical procedure that has an established way of measuring results, then we try and build our next generation of assessments in an upwardly compatible manner. Um, it's a little bit hard, but uh, you notice in that example of the ADHD test that there was like letters being flashed on the screen. Well, that's because it's predicated upon some other assessments that use that paradigm. So you'll see like VR Stroop tests built into some of the assessments. So in, in some ways we're sort of carrying along these legacy assessments, but uh, I think we really need to establish a whole new generation. Now that we can measure people's behavior in a virtual environment, where people are looking, what they're doing, who they're interacting with, we have to come up with a whole new library. I, I think I'm only gonna have to, I would like to have some time for the next presenters to get ready and all that, so I'll probably just take one more question, but we can all, hang out and talk later too. And I hope you guys stay for the rest of the day. There's a lot of exciting talks coming up. Okay. Yes. Um, there's, a, there's a company I'm pretty excited about, and I'm sure there's others, called MTech. Um, they're out of uh, London, and they've come up with inserts that you can put inside a HMD that uses cameras, I think, in some cases, and EMG sensors in other cases, and, um, and algorithms to, to capture facial expression and put it onto your avatar. And I think that'll make a big difference. Uh, but I think we also have a whole, you know, we have a whole body to capture too and get in. So, um, you know, there are data suits and things like that, but it, we'll have to use some clever technology to get our whole bodies and the communication we do with our whole body into VR. But, there are some groups looking at facial expression. I'm excited about that. EMTEQ, I believe. Um, uh, uh, if you see me later, I'll, I'll try and get the link to it. Okay, does anybody have one last burning question or can we all sort of break and talk in the hallway? Um, let's do that. Thank you very much. All right.